Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you for that, guys. That was great. And thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate it. How many of you are glad that you're here? I, uh, I want to I hear from a few of you just so I know where you are tonight. I want to hear from uh, Africa. I don't want to hear from Africa anymore. All right? I want to hear, I want to hear from uh, Europe. All right, we got a few. How about this? I want to hear from uh, Asia. All right, now watch this. Here's my favorite continent. I want to hear from Texas. Hey, I want to hear from Smoking for Jesus. <laughs> that is my new all time favorite name for a Christian school, right back there, I'm telling you. I thought, I thought that was a misprint. I saw it, I heard the story, and I love it. Thank you for being here. Uh, let me see, I want to hear it from Canada. All right, all right, all right, Canada, hold your feet up, hold your feet up, hold your feet up. I want to make sure you don't have ice skates on. All right, good. I want to hear from Mexico. All right, good. Let me see, who, who did we not hear from? Oh, 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 here we go, here we go, here. I want to hear from Antarctica. Yeah. You, you always have that one kid who's directionally challenged. It's like, are we from Antarctica? No, no, you're not. That's where penguins live, and it's really cold. And they, I think, I think. Well, thank you for coming tonight. I appreciate you being here. Uh, this is my uh, fourth time at ISC. Uh, I was here uh, three years ago, four years ago, I guess now, right here in this room for the first time, and then I was in uh, New Mexico. How many were here for our new... Wait a minute. Are you from New Mexico? Wow, all right, good. And then, uh, then I was in Missouri. Now I'm back in Pennsylvania, and so that's good. Oh, that's good. How many, how many are uh, from Pennsylvania? Home state people, okay, good, excellent. I heard a group from Moscow, of course, Africa, Asia. I wonder which group is the farthest away. I wonder, do we know that, Brother Ballinger? Which group would have traveled the farthest? Okay, let's do this, let's do this. If you, if you travel by airplane, I want you to stand up. If you travel by airplane, I want you to stand up. If you travel by airplane. Okay? If you traveled across an ocean, I want you to remain standing. If you traveled by at least three different airplanes just to get here, I want you to remain standing. If you traveled by three airplanes and a camel, I want you to remain standing. If you are not lying, I want you to remain standing. Well, I don't think that was a good way to figure it out, but thank you for coming anyway. Listen to me, there are thousands of people, thousands of people right now watching us all across the world. You know what that means? That means that even though you're 5,000 miles away from your mom, she's still watching you. <laughs> she's going to be like, you need to sit up. I was watching you. She's watching you. So sit up straight. Listen up. I know we're going to have a great night together. Hey, I hope you have a Bible with you tonight. Would you take your Bible out right now? Everybody should have a Bible. I want you to take your Bible out right now. And I want you to turn to a little book in the Old Testament called Ruth. Ruth, is anybody in here named Ruth? One girl. I'm famous, okay? 
Is anyone in here not named Ruth? <laughs> you know, no, uh, honestly, honestly, I think, I think you would cheer for anything. I mean, you're so hyped up right now. Okay, what? what? Watch. Uh, I'll prove it. Ready? Peanut butter! Pine cones! Dirt! It's a good crowd. I'm telling you. It's an excited crowd. Hey! Jesus! Ruth chapter 1, in your Bible, would you stand with me please? Ruth chapter 1. In a moment we're going to read a couple of verses. And after we read these verses, we're going to have a word of prayer. After we pray, we're going to sit down and I just want you for a few minutes to give your undivided attention to a truth that I believe is life transforming. In a moment after we read the verses and have a word of prayer, I want you to set your noisemakers just aside. I want you to set any distractions aside. I want, you, I want you to keep your Bible right there on your lap. Most of all, I want you to give me your undivided attention. I truly believe that the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside of the hearts of believers, I believe that the Holy Spirit of God wants to use the Word of God to change us tonight in some real way. I believe that. And so in just a moment when I read the Scripture, and then when we pray, I want you to pray. Would you do that for me? And when I pray out loud, I want you to pray silently in your heart. And I want you to, I want you to pray something like this in a moment. I want you to say to the Lord, Lord, would you please speak to me? I want you to ask the Lord, I want you to ask the Lord to do that tonight. Lord, would you please speak to me? And then I want you to add something to that prayer too. I want you to say this to the Lord. If you can mean it, I want you to say this. Lord, would you please speak to me? And if you do, would you please help me to do what you tell me to do? I challenge you in a moment when we all pray together, I challenge you to pray a prayer something like that to the, to the Lord. Ruth chapter 1 in your Bible this evening, and I want you to look at verse 16, where the Bible says, and Ruth said, do you see that in verse 16? And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee. She's speaking to her mother-in-law. A woman by the name of Naomi. Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. Naomi had told her to stay home. Look at the end of verse 16. For whither thou goest, in other words, wherever you go, I will go. And where thou lodgest, in other words, where you live, I will lodge, I will live. Watch this. Thy people shall be my people, and now watch the very last part of verse 16, because this is the biggest decision that Ruth ever made in her life. The biggest decision and the best decision that Ruth ever made in her life that changed her entire life is found in the last of four words of verse 16. Look at it, would you? Verse 16. And Thy God, see that? Thy God, my God. Thy God, my God. I want you to say those four words with me. Ready? Thy God, my God. Now this time like we mean it. Ready? Thy God, my God. You know, that's the prayer. That's the prayer of every one of your teachers. That's the prayer of every one of your dads and moms and pastors. That's the prayer of these faithful ACE staff members. That's their prayer. Their, their prayer is that the God that we know would be the God that you know. The God that has helped us and has saved us would be the God that would help you and, 
and saved you. And for so many of you, that's already been your decision. But I've got to imagine tonight that there are some who need to make that God your God. I want to talk about this girl, Ruth, and the difference she made because of one decision that started right here in verse 16. Let's pray together. Our Father, I'm grateful for this time to, tonight that you have given me to speak to these young people and to their sponsors and to many thousands of others that are even now listening in all across the world. And Father, I pray that you would use these moments in a very special way. I pray that you would consecrate them, make them holy. I pray that tonight you would do a work on the inside of us that, that only you can do. I pray that you would speak significantly. I pray that each one of us would be entirely attentive to everything that you would say. And may the end result of tonight be that many, many, many of us here and across the world would make decisions that would honor and glorify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. and You may be seated. I want to tell you a story tonight. I love stories. And I love telling stories. And the Bible is full of stories. I want to tell you a story tonight. It's a story that maybe some of you have heard, but it's a really, really good story. It's a story that by the end of the story, I think that you're going to learn some things that will help your story. Because know this tonight, you have a story. And your story is unique. Your story is different than anyone else's story. And God wants to use your story in a way that He's used no other story in all of history. And the seven a billion people in the world, you, my friend, are a designer model. There is nobody like you. When God made you, He threw away the mold. And God has something that He wants to do in your life and through your life that He can do with nobody else. So I want you to listen to the story of somebody, watch this, somebody who was a nobody, who became a somebody for God. Somebody who was a nobody, who became a somebody for God. Somebody who became significant in the will of God. That somebody can be you. Let's tell the story. Well, once upon a time, because that's the way all good stories start. Once upon a time, there was a, a family. Uh, maybe a little bit like your family. I don't know how many children are in your family, but this family had two children. There was a mom, there was a dad, and there were two boys. No girls in the family, but a mom and a dad and two boys. Matter of fact, in those days, that was a small family. Just a, a mom and a dad and two boys. Now, the mom's name was Naomi. Can you say that with me? The mom's name was? And the father's name was Elimelech. Let's try that one together. Ready? Elimelech. So Elimelech and Naomi, they lived in a very special place. Now, you know the place already because you've heard about it many, many times. The name of the place where Naomi and Elimelech lived was a place called Bethlehem. Now, I, I know that's famous to you because we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But understand this, back when Elimelech and Naomi lived, Bethlehem was not an important place. Back when Elimelech and Naomi lived, nobody knew about Bethlehem. Matter of fact, the Bible says that when Elimelech and Naomi lived, Bethlehem was just a little town among thousands of other places. And so they're just in a little out-of-the-way place called Bethlehem. Now, Elimelech and Naomi have two boys. The, the, the name of the older boy is, uh, is Malon. Let's see if we can try that one together. Ready? His name is? Malon, good. And the name of the second son was Kilion. Can you say that? His name was? So here's the family. We've got Elimelech, we have Naomi, we have Malon, and we have Kilion. And they probably had a dog because every good family has a dog. Bad families have cats. That's true. That's true. I'm just going to tell you the truth tonight, okay? <laughs> Neutral families have fish, but fish really aren't pets. 
they just swim around, they don't fetch anything, they don't ever give you a hug, and after a while you just get tired of them and you eat them, okay? So there's dogs and cats, dogs are good, cats are bad, fish are neutral. So here's Elimelech, Naomi, Malon, and Kilan. Now here's what happened. The Bible teaches that a famine came to their land. So now things are going really bad. Why? Because uh, they can't grow crops. Uh, they can't get food. And, and things are, are, are difficult. Now, God allowed this. And the reason why God allowed this is because God wanted them to look back to Him. Because the people in the country were doing things that were right in their own eyes, not in the eyes of God. And so sometimes when we don't listen to God, God has to use other things in our life to get our attention. So that's what God was doing. God was getting the attention of people saying, hey, look back to me, pray back to me. But they weren't listening. And so here's what Elimelech decided to do. Elimelech decided that instead of listening to God, instead of trusting God like many others did, he decided that he would go to a, another place where things weren't as bad, and there he would live for just a, enough time as it would take uh, for things to get better over here. So Elimelech and Naomi and Malon and Kilion decided that they would leave Bethlehem God's place, God's country, and go to a place called Moab. Now, in the Bible, Moab was not a good place. Moab was a place that God had already told his people, don't go there. And can I just say this? When God tells you not to do something, don't do it. But uh, they thought they knew better. They thought they knew better than God. And after all, we're not going to go and stay there. We're just going to go and be there for a while. They just made this uh, rationalization in their minds. And so uh, Elimelech and Naomi, uh, they left their home and their sons, Malon and Kilion. And I don't know how you traveled back in those days, but maybe they packed a big camel or something. But they went to Moab. And there in Moab, something happened. Are you listening? Something happened in Moab that was really, really bad. Here's what happened. When they got to Moab, Elimelech, remember him? He's the dad. Elimelech died. That's a sad thing. He, he didn't plan to go to Moab and die, but, but that's what happened. And can I say this? After he died, his sons made really, really bad choices. After Elimelech died, Malon, the oldest son, and Kilion, the second son, they both married Moabite girls. Now listen, that was wrong. That was wrong. God had made it very clear that his people were not to marry people that did not know God. And can I just say this, young people? You should never consider dating or marrying anybody that does not know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, her personal Savior. And not just a person that knows Christ, but a person that's willing to follow him with their lives. But that's what not what Malon and Kilion did. Malon and Kilion, they married Moabite girls. Now, Malon, he married a girl by the name of Ruth. Kilion, he married a girl by the name of Orpah. Uh, Ruth and Orpah, Moabite girls. And what happened? Well, here's what happened. Really, really sad. Really, really sad. Elimelech, he already died. Then the Bible says that Malon died. And uh, Kilion died. And so now the only person that's left in the entire family that's alive is Naomi. She's all by herself. Her husband has died. Both of her boys have, di have, have died. And now she has two daughters-in-law. And they have no children. There's no men in their lives to take care of them. It's a really, really bad situation. And then, to add insult to injury, here's what happens. Naomi begins to hear. She begins to hear that back home in Bethlehem, God is blessing. If they had only waited, if they had only been faithful, if they had only been patient, if they had only trusted God, but they hadn't. So now Naomi, she's so upset. Matter of fact, she's bitter. The Bible says she gets bitter. She's just mad. She's mad at people. She's mad at God. She doesn't understand. So here's what she does. Ready for this? Here's what she does. She looks at both of her daughters-in-law. She looks at Ruth, and she looks at Orpah, and she says, girls... I'm going to go back to Bethlehem. Now, girls, there's nothing in Bethlehem for you. 
Back in Bethlehem, that's my country. Back in Bethlehem, that's my language. Back in Bethlehem, that's my culture. Back in Bethlehem, that's my religion. Back in Bethlehem, those are my people. And so a Ruth and Orpah, as much as I love you, as much as we have a connection, Ruth and Orpah, go home. Now listen. Ruth and, and Orpah, they, they loved Naomi. They, they didn't want to leave Naomi. They were both willing to go with Naomi to Bethlehem. So, so they, did, they packed their bags. It took them like three weeks. Why? Because girls take forever to pack. <laughs> forever! It's like, guys... Well, guys, when we travel, you know, we got this thing down pat. Grab a toothbrush, okay, put it in your pocket, let's go, right? <laughs> and if you forget the toothbrush, there's a Walmart everywhere, okay? <laughs> Girls, it's like, oh, what am I going to wear at Tuesday at 9 o'clock? What am I going to wear at Tuesday at 10 o'clock? What if it rains? What about my hair? What about, who cares? <laughs> so here's Naomi. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Here's Ruth, here's Ruth, Here, here's, here's Orpah. Now, they're not really there, okay? There's one, there's one girl in the audience going, I don't see them, okay? We're pretending, okay? We're pretending. So here's Ruth and here's Orpah, and Naomi says, okay, girls, stay home. They both said, no, no, we're going with you. So they get, they, they get going. They're on their way now. Here they are. They're going to Bethlehem. There's a big green bush in the way. They walk around it. They're coming toward Bethlehem. As they're going, the Bible says, Naomi stops again. Here's what she says. She says, girls, I'm going to Bethlehem. There is nothing in Bethlehem for you. Your best chance for a future is for you to go back. Your best chance for you is to go home. Get married Go back to your parents' homes. There is nothing good that's going to happen here. I'm a bitter old woman. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to get married again and then maybe have a son like that's really going to happen? And then raise that son, then you're going to marry him one day? That doesn't make any sense. Girls, go home. Well, listen. When Naomi said that, those girls were upset. And Orpah, remember the, the wife of Kilian? She saw the logic of what Naomi said, and she began to cry. She hugged her, her mother-in-law. She loved Naomi, and Naomi hugged her, and, and Orpah went home, and that was the last time in the Bible we ever hear about this young lady named Orpah. And then Ruth, what did she do? Well, we already saw what she did. Ruth looked at her mother-in-law and said, I, I, I'm not leaving. I, I'm not leaving. I, I, I'm going to go. I'm going to go where you go, and, and I'm going to live where you live. And, and your people—they're going to be my people. I, I can learn a new language, and, and I can learn a new cu culture. And I guess the bottom line is this, Naomi: your God will be my God. That's what we call Ruth's salvation experience. If we put this in the New Testament sense. This is Ruth getting saved. This is Ruth saying, I don't believe in the gods of Moab. I don't believe in the religion that I was raised in. I don't believe in all that was taught me here. I believe in the one God of the Bible. I put my faith and trust in Him. Let me just ask you a question tonight. Has there ever been a time and a place in your life when you made this Ruth decision? Now, if there has been in your mind right now, I want you to go right there in your mind. Where were you? No, don't talk out loud. Where were you? For Ruth, she was on the road to Bethlehem. Where were you? Where were you when you trusted Christ as your Savior? I knelt down by my couch in Newington, Connecticut at 18 Dowd Street. That was our address. I can picture the carpet. I can picture the couch. I knelt down as a 16-year-old boy, and I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life and become my personal Lord and Savior. Hey, I was saved that night many years ago as a 16-year-old boy. Hey, where were you saved? Where did you ask Jesus? Where did God, the God of the Bible, the God of your teacher, the God of your mom, the God of your pastor, when did that God 
become your God. Because in Ruth's life, it took place in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 16. And listen to me, my friends. That one decision catapulted Ruth into a whole new life of making a difference. Now, how did Ruth go from a nobody to a somebody? How did Ruth do it? I think it started with the decision to, to make thy God my God. It started with salvation. But watch this. Watch this. It, didn't, it started with salvation, but it didn't end there. Here's what Ruth began to do after she got saved. Now, if you know Christ is your Savior, I'm just saying right now, that's wonderful. That keeps you out of hell. Uh, you won't spend eternity uh, in a lake of fire. But let me just tell you this. If, uh, if, you don't know, if you know Jesus as your Savior, that's just a starting point. That's just a beginning place. That's just a new birth. Now you've got to grow. I want to show you the three big decisions that Ruth made after she got saved. That made her a woman that made a difference. Three big decisions. If you have a pen, want to write them down? Uh, here, here they are. Number one. What three big decisions did Ruth make that caused her to be a difference maker in her generation? Number one. Ready? Ruth decided to be selfless. Ruth decided to be selfless. In other words, Ruth said, I'm going to make a decision in my life that's not about what I want. It's not about what's good for me. It's not about what I think is going to bring me success. It's not about what I think is going to be uh, the most beneficial for me. I'm going to make a decision in my life that is not for me. It's for the benefit of other people. Hey, Mom. Hey, Naomi. I know that it's probably better for me to go home. I know there's probably more opportunities back in Moab. I know that that's probably the best chance I'll ever have to get married. I, I know I'll probably never get married over here. I, I probably will always be an outcast in your country. But I don't care. I'm not making a decision based upon what I want. I'm making a decision that's best for God and for others. Listen, young people, I challenge you. Are you 15 years old tonight? Are you 18 years old tonight? Is this your first ISC convention as a 13-year-old? Can I just say this tonight? The life that God blesses is a life that says, God, it's not about me. It's about the people that I can serve. And Ruth said, I'm going to be selfless. Selfless with my feelings. Hey, every young lady in her deepest heart desire, every young lady wants to get married. Man, she dreams about it. Girls, don't tell me you don't want to get married. You want to find that nice, handsome young man. Some of those young men have been scoping during this conference. They have their radar up. There she is. I'm going to marry her one day. <laughs> then you, you muster up all your courage to say something really cool. So you say, hi. <laughs> and she goes, <laughs> <laughs> And then you go back to your room and you talk to all your friends and say, Did you see that? He said, hi. <laughs> Do you see that? I think he likes me. <laughs> hey, everybody, everybody wants to feel like, man, I, I want to meet that right person. I, I want to get married one day. I want to have a family. Hey, that's a natural desire. Don't you think Ruth had that desire? Don't you think Ruth said, well, I'd love to get married. Now, I'd love to have a family. But you know what she was doing? She was saying, I'm going to be selfless. I'll probably never get married. That's what, Naomi, that's what Naomi just told her. I'll probably never have a family. But it's not about all that. I'm not living my life for me. I'm going to be selfless with my feelings. I'm going to be selfless with my future. 
And I'm just going to go and serve God by serving this bitter old woman. Now, I know the world will never tell you that. You'll never get on TV and see an advertisement. You want to be a success? Don't ever get married and serve bitter old people. (laughs) You'll never find it. But you know what? If you read your Bible, you'll find Jesus said, the greatest among you shall be your servant. You'll find Jesus saying, he that will find his life must first lose it. The way up is the way down. Boy, you'll find it. Hey, you want to make a difference in this world? Decide to be selfless. Number two. Chapter two, my friends, is a very interesting chapter in the Bible. It helps us begin to know the rest of the story. Because now, Naomi and Ruth have arrived in Bethlehem. But not like today where you go to a new city and maybe people welcome you like, welcome to our city. Or, uh, here's a, a wonderful gift to give you. No, back in the Bible days, the, there was no uh, special uh, welcome for people that came from other places. No, if you were going to live, nobody was going to give you food. No one was going to give you something. If you were going to live, somebody had to go out and work. Because the Bible says that if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. So somebody had to work to feed this small family of a bitter mother-in-law and her new Moabite daughter-in-law that are now living in Bethlehem. So who do you think it is that goes out and works for both of them? Well, it's not Naomi. Naomi, she's too busy at home just uh, having her little pity party. You know, God's been so mean to me, and my life is so bad, and I don't even want you to call me Naomi anymore. Just call me Mara. I'm bitter. And here's Ruth. She doesn't know anybody. Here's Ruth. She doesn't speak the language well. Here's Ruth. She has no family members. Here's Ruth. What is she going to do to feed her mother-in-law, to feed herself? Well, here's what she does. See, back in Bible days, God had this law. Here's the way the law worked. God said to his people, okay, when you plant a field, let's say it's a field of corn, When you plant a field, plant the field of corn, but when you reap the corn, in other words, when you when you actually pick it, okay, when it when it's when it's uh, when when it's ripe and you pick it to to eat it, when you reap the corn, then the corners of the field, you've got to leave the corners. You've got to leave the corners alone so that people that don't have food and people that are poor, they can come and they can grab the corners. Oh, and not only that, when you reap a field. When the reapers go through picking the corn, if they miss a piece of corn, don't let them go back and get it, okay? If they miss something, then the strangers, people that aren't from there, they can come and they can find that one piece that was missed or that one piece that got stepped on. And they can, so that's what Ruth did. Ruth thought, well, that's the only thing I can do. I don't have a skilled job. I don't have a family member. I'm going to go work out, listen to me, I'm going to go work out in the hot sun All day long, no water, no food, no protection. Because back in those days, the workers back in the fields, they weren't nice people. And it was not uncommon for the workers in a field to take advantage of a young lady working all by herself. So can you picture Ruth? She goes out to work and she's scared. She doesn't know anybody, and there's all these men working, and she has her basket, and she's just trying to gather uh, enough food, may, maybe just to be able to eat for one day. Well, well, listen, while all that's going on, while all that's going on, the owner of the field comes out to check on the job. So the owner of the field comes out, and his name is Boaz. Can you say that with me? His name is? And Boaz, he's a rich man, and Boaz, he comes out to the field, and he walks out, and he calls over the, uh, the, the worker in the field, the, the, the foreman, the head worker, and he says to him, he says, uh, so uh, how are things going today? And the man says, well, they're going well. And Boaz says, and I noticed that, that young lady over there in the field, I, I don't think I've ever seen her uh, before. Who is that? And the worker said, well, that's the Moabitess girl. Oh, I... I 
I, I've heard about her. I, I, I've heard her story. And can I just say this? When you think that no one knows what you're going through, Boaz in the Bible is a good type of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus always knows what you're going through. And when other people don't see your struggle, please know this, Jesus knows you right where you are. He's touched with the feeling of your infirmity. He knows exactly what you're going through. And so Boaz, he said, I I've heard about her. Send her over here. Well, can you imagine? Now here's Ruth. She probably thinks she's done something wrong. So Ruth, she comes over to Boaz, and I can picture her bowing, and I can picture her uh, very submissive. And, and Boaz said, uh, Ruth, I've heard about your story. He said, Ruth, there's a couple things I want to do for you. Number one, Ruth, I want to give you water. Because you're out here and you're thirsty and I've got this well and the well is for my people, but I want you to be able to have free water from my well. And Ruth, uh, I also want you to uh, have food. And so Ruth, I want you to eat with my workers. Matter of fact, by the end of the chapter, he made her one of his workers. I want you to, to, to know that you have food. You can take a break and eat with my work. Oh, and by the way, uh, Ruth, I, I want you to know that you have no fear. I'm going to tell the young man that you are to be protected. So I'm going to give you food and water and protection. Do you know what Ruth said? Oh, Ruth said, oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. You know what our problem is? And can I just, those of you from different countries for a second, could you just listen in? But I'm going to just talk to my fellow Americans for a moment. Okay, so if you're from different countries, just listen in. And can I just talk to my fellow Americans? You know what our problem is? And I can say this because I am an American. Our problem is we're spoiled. We're spoiled. We have way too much, and we expect way too much. You know what Ruth did? Ruth said, oh, I'm so content. You would give me food. You would give me water. You would give me a job. I am so, thank you. Hey, we need a generation of teenagers that are content with the basic necessities of life. The Bible says, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. The love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Hey, Paul said to Timothy, a young man, lay hold on eternal life. Hey, Timothy, live for stuff that will outlive you. Live for stuff that will outlive you. And I challenge the teenagers in this room just now, live in such a way that you'll be glad you did live that way a thousand years from now, a million years from now, a billion years from now. Live for eternity. Well, Ruth, Ruth is so excited. Here's what Boaz said. Boaz said, uh, and Ruth, uh, the Lord, I'm asking the Lord to bless you and in ways that I cannot. I've just done a little bit for you, but Ruth, I, I'm praying that God, I'm praying that God does a lot for you. And you know what Boaz does? This is kind of cool. Boaz goes back to his worker and he says, hey guys, <clears throat> when you're working today and you're reaping the fields, every now and then I just want you to take a handful of what you've reaped and just leave it on the ground. Well, well boss, that, that that would be wasteful. Hey, it's my field. It's my stuff. Do what I say. Yes, sir. So what happens? Boy, they go back to work, and Ruth, she's got a big drink of water, and she gets some food, and she's excited now, and she goes back to work. But the men, they're working, and every now and then, just like Boaz said, they take some of their food, and they put it right on the ground. They keep on working. And then here's Ruth. Boy, she's working, and she's looking for food. She can't find. Oh, look it. She picks up, look at that. She puts it in her basket. Oh, those dumb workers. She looks up, <laughs> look it. She picks it up over here. Oh, and look it. She picks it up over You know that's what God does for you? God gives you little blessings along the way to keep you moving forward. Oh my, oh my. 
Ruth is so excited. She's got this big old basket of food. She's walking home or she puts it on her head. <laughs> She's walking home. She gets home that night. Guess who's home? Well, the only other person that lives there, Naomi. And what does Naomi say to Ruth? Well, the Bible doesn't say, but Naomi's a mom. And all moms ask the same question when you come home. Well, first of all, they tell you something, and then they ask you a question. First thing they say, take your shoes off, okay? And then they say, how was your day? And if you're a guy, now guys, help me on this. Whether you're a man or a teenage boy, it doesn't make a difference. If you're male, if, you're, if, if your wife or mother says, how was your day, your answer is, good. And that's all that matters. Girls, when we say good, that means we didn't kill anybody. <laughs> that means that nobody killed us. It was good. The key to satisfaction is lower your expectations. Okay? Good. But when you ask a girl that question, oh, how was your day? Oh, how was my day? Well, I got up, I couldn't do a thing with my hair, and then I lost my, I, 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 I woke up, I was dreaming, I, I, too much information. <laughs> so Naomi, Naomi says to Ruth, how was your day? She tells her all about her day. She says, well, I went to the field, I was kind of scared, I was really thirsty, and then mom, the owner of the field came out, his name was Boaz, and Naomi's like, ding, 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 ding. Did you say Boaz? Yeah, yeah, Bo Boaz. Oh. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Naomi begins to realize, wait one minute. The Bible has this other law, like the law about the field. The Bible has this other law. Here's the other law. The other law is that if a woman has a husband who dies, and when that husband dies, if the woman doesn't have any children, then the law says that a close relative of the dead husband can then marry that widow woman who doesn't have children, and they can become married, and then when they have children, they'll name the children after the name of the dead husband so that he does not lose his, his heritage. It's called the law of the kinsman redeemer. So Naomi's thinking, oh, wait a minute. Maybe Boaz is going to be my daughter-in-law's next husband. Because that's what moms and grandmas do. <laughs> They're always looking for husbands for their granddaughters. Your grandmother right now is in Walmart showing your picture to somebody you don't even know. <laughs> this is my granddaughter. Isn't she pretty? Stop, Grandma! Why was Ruth significant? Can I tell you? She made a big decision to get saved. But after she got saved, she decided to be selfless. In chapter 2, she desired to be a servant. She said, you know what? My life is, is a minimum wage job. My life is working out in a field. My life is living from day to day. My life is sacrificing so I have food on the table. But you know what God did? God used a selfless, servant-minded girl. And sometimes you think, you know, Pastor Skelly, I, I, I'm not the smartest person at this conference. I'm not the most talented person. But I see these guys singing in that wonderful song that was played. I see the incredible ventriloquism that was performed earlier. You say, Pastor Skelly, I, I, I could never be that person. Well, listen, the world counts success by getting to the top. The world counts success by how good you are in a given field. But you know how God counts success? By being selfless. By being a servant. Not everyone can be number one in basketball. Not everyone can win the table tennis competition. Not everyone can run fastest and get the blue ribbon, but everybody can be selfless. And everybody, by God's 
marvelous, amazing grace can be a servant. And so here we have a girl that decided to be selfless. Here we have a girl that desired to be a servant. That brings us to chapter 3. So we're telling a story. Chapter 3, the barley season is over. That's the season in which Ruth has been working. And now the season's over. So it might be that now Ruth has to move on. It might be that now Ruth will never see Boaz again. And, and listen, Naomi knows that. And Naomi, she wants Ruth to get married. But Ruth doesn't know it yet. So Naomi comes up with this plan because she knows, she just knows, at the end of the season, the owner of the field is going to come out to what they call the threshing floor. Now some of you know what that is. There's a hard surface usually on the top of the hill where it's really windy, where they would take the grain with kind of like a pitchfork and, and throw it up in the air, and the wind would come and, and blow away the lighter husk or outside, and to blow it away, and the grain would fall to the ground. And if you just do that over and over and over again, eventually all the grain is on the floor. That's the important part of the crop. That's the important part of the entire season, and that's why the owner of the field is going to be there. Well, Naomi knows that. So Naomi, she comes up with a plan. Because she wants her daughter-in-law, Ruth, to get married to Boaz. So here's her plan. She says, Ruth, here's what you need, here's what you need to do. She says, tonight, Boaz, he's going to be working out in the field. And when he's working out in the field, Ruth, here's what I want you to do. I want you to hide and spy on him. And then when he's done working, I just want you to watch when he's done working, I want you to watch him. Because after he's done working, he's going to start eating. Because that's what guys do. Guys, we work, and then we eat. And so, so she, you're going to watch him work. Yeah, we can clap for that, sure. Okay, we're working, eat. And then, after he's done eating, just watch him. Watch him, Ruth. Because then, he's going to go to sleep. Because that's what guys do. They work. They eat, and they sleep, and they play basketball in between, okay? So they work, <laughs> they eat, and they sleep, right? So then, hey Ruth, then after he sleeps, which it takes guys about 20 seconds to fall asleep, okay? So after he, after he sleeps, then here's what I want you to do, Ruth. I want you to sneak up, be very, very quiet. I want you to climb underneath his blanket. I want you to lay down by his feet <laughs> and just stay there. And then, when he wakes up, ask him if he'll marry you. <laughs> That's the plan. I don't know what's crazier, the plan or the fact that Ruth did it. Okay, so here's what happened. Ready? Here's what happened. That night, here's Boaz. Man, he's working. Why? Because that's what guys do. They work. And when they work really hard, they look at their own muscles. Mm. <laughs> he's working. And Ruth, she's hiding. He's being quiet. Oh, he's done. He's done working. He starts eating. He goes to Burger King. Man, he gets a <laughs> double Whopper with cheese. Big old, large. He exchanges his French fries for onion rings because that's what men do. He gets a big Diet Coke because that justifies all the calories. <laughs> he's just eating. He doesn't worry about chewing with his mouth closed. He doesn't care. He's just eating. Loves it. She's watching the whole time. Man, can he eat. Just watching. <laughs> and then, after he eats, he goes to sleep. He gets his little Fred Flintstone blankie. Because <laughs> real men don't care. 
He gets his little pillow. He lays down. Night, night. And the entire time, Ruth is watching. She's waiting for that moment. She's waiting for the moment when he falls asleep. And she knows it because she can hear the thunder, him snoring. She steps on a little field mouse. Ah! <laughs> he doesn't wake up. She gets all the way down by his feet. She puts on a gas mask <laughs> so that she can survive. Ever so slowly, she curls in right by his feet under the blankie. Man, does it stink in here. <laughs> and she just waits. And we don't know how long it takes, but sometime that night, Boaz wakes up. Can you imagine waking? Maybe he was dreaming about some squirrel. <laughs> chewing on his big toe. But Boaz wakes up and like, ah! And then Ruth says, Will you marry me? And Boaz goes, ah! <laughs> and here's what Boaz says. Boaz says, Ruth, you are an honorable woman. He said, Ruth, you could have had any young man, rich or poor. You know, Ruth must have been a beautiful girl. But Ruth didn't want just anybody. You know who Ruth wanted? Ruth wanted God's choice. Ruth wanted the one that the Bible outlined for her. Ruth didn't want to just marry anybody. Ruth wanted to marry the one that her mother had counseled her to go after. Boy, she was not only selfless. That's chapter one. She was not only a servant. That's chapter two. But boy, I find in chapter three, she was submissive. She was submissive to God's word. What the law said about the kinsman redeemer. She was submissive to her, her, her authority, her spiritual authority in her life, her mother. Even though the plan didn't seem to make sense, she did it anyway. Why? Because it's always right to follow godly counsel, even when you don't entirely understand it. Here's what Boaz said. Ready? I, I must hasten. Boaz said, Ruth... I would love to marry you, but here's the problem. He, there's another person that is a closer relative to your dead husband than, than I. Which means, according to the law, that he has the first chance to marry you. And so, Ruth, I can't marry you until I ask him. So here's the good news, Ruth. The good news is, tomorrow, you're going to get married. The bad news is, you, don't, you might not know who it is. <laughs> Girls, can you imagine if I told you, tomorrow you're going to get married. It might be the guy you love, or it might be some random guy you've never met before. <laughs> so here's what happens. He gives her a bunch of gifts. Ready for this? She walks home. She gets home, and Naomi, she's been waiting. Naomi says, how was your night? <laughs> and Ruth says, good. <laughs> well, what, 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 what happened? Did, what, did, did, was he working? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, well did, did, he, did he eat? Yeah. <laughs> did, 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 he, did he go to sleep? Uh-huh. 
Well, did you, did you sneak up? I did. Well, did you climb under the, 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 the blanket by his feet? Yeah. <laughs> well, did he wake up? Uh-huh. Well, did you ask him? Yes. Well, then what's wrong? <gasps> There's somebody else. <laughs> Girls, listen, we don't know what to do when you cry. When girls cry, guys, we just, we go out and play basketball. We just don't know what to do. It's like, she'll get over it, you know. Here's what mom said, ready? Mom said this. Shh. Naomi said, shh. He's going to take care of it. Sometimes in life, you just have to, shh. He's going to take care of it. So here's what happens, and I'm done, I'm done. Here, here's what happens, chapter 4. Boaz, he, he wants to marry Ruth, he loves Ruth. He, he wants to marry Ruth. So, so Boaz, he sits on the steps by the city gate, because that's where all the business was transacted. And he, he's waiting for that one guy to come by. The one guy that's related. Finally, the one guy comes by, here's all the elders of the town sitting with him. He wants to make a deal. So he says to the guy, he says, ho, oh, such an one, come here. The guy comes over, and Boaz says, uh, hey, listen, I've got a business deal to make with you. There, there's some property that our, our brother Elimelech had, and, and we can get that property. Uh, uh, you have first dibs on it, but I'd like to have that property. Uh, do, can I have the property, or do you want it? The man said, well, I want it. And then Boaz said, oh, I forgot to tell you one tinsy little detail. Along with the property comes one free wife. Wouldn't that make marriage so much easier, guys? You don't have to go through the whole dating thing. Just go down to Walmart, buy something, want a wife with that? Sure. You know, I mean, <laughs> put her in the cart. You know? Just run her over the scanner. Ding! Okay, I got a wife. It's great. Want to put her in a plastic bag? No, I'll just take her. I'll just take her out. Give me the receipt. I might have to return her. Uh, anyway. So the guy says, no, I don't want a wife. I, I got a wife. So Boaz says, good. Back in those days, to make a deal, you take off your shoe and give it. <laughs> Weird. But they did. So here's what happened. Ready? Here we are. So Boaz now legally, legally, he can marry Ruth. I don't know how this happened, but Boaz, he found Ruth as soon as he could. Ruth. Ruth, will you marry me? She's like, there's people over here taking pictures with iPhones. No. <laughs> Could have posted on Facebook that day. Ruth says, yes. Now listen to me. Listen to me. They get married. They have a son. The neighbor women name the son. Don't let neighbor women <laughs> name your children because when you do you come up with names like Obed <laughs> that this little boy Obed Naomi watches Obed oh say Pastor Scott I, I don't know who Obed is oh, you, you kind of do because Obed he has a son and his son's name is is Jesse and you know who Jesse is, because Jesse, he has some sons, and his youngest son's name is, is David. And David has some sons, and David's youngest son's name is Solomon. And Solomon has some sons, and has a lot of wives. And <laughs> he has a son by the name of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam has a son by the name of Ahijah. And Ahijah has a son by the name of, of Asa. And Asa has a son by the by the name of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat is, is a son who has a son, who has a son, who has a son, who has a son, whose name is, whose name is Jesus. And that's why Jesus came back to be born in Bethlehem. 
because he was of the house and lineage of, of David. Here's a, here's a little girl, a nobody, living in Moab, doesn't even know God. But man, she makes a decision. Thy God will be my God. Nobody ever might know my name, and that doesn't really make a difference, but I'm going to spend my life being selfless. It's not about me. I'm going to spend my life serving the people that are near me, that are close to me. I'm going to love my mom and serve the people and work hard. I'm going to do what God says, and I'm going to do what my parents say. And this selfless, submissive servant became the grandmother of Jesus Christ. And isn't that where significance is? Significance is always relative to your relationship with Jesus Christ. So what am I looking for tonight? I'm not looking for somebody to do some great deed. I'm not looking for somebody to surrender to be a great missionary to China one day, although we need that. You know what I'm looking for right now? I'm looking for some teenagers that would say, Pastor Skelly, I'm willing to be a selfless, submissive servant. And before you change the room, before you change the world, go home and clean your room. Before you change the world, go home and be respectful to your mom and dad. And before you change the world, go home and help your pastor sweep the floor after church. Before you change the world, learn how to love the person right next to you. Because what this world needs is selfless, submissive servants. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes tonight, please.